Welcome to a new episode of Shaping Sustainable Supply Chains. In the last podcast, we looked at food supply chains in Africa. Today, we will have a look at another vital issue for our planet and talk about raw materials or raw minerals like platinum and copper. And we will ask, is sustainability a chance for the mining industry to get rid of its dirty image? I'm Nicholas Martin. Thank you for listening. It's a paradox. On the way to a more sustainable society, we need a lot of raw materials. Wind generators, electric motors and digitalization have increased the demand for certain materials. But almost no other industry has a worse image when it comes to sustainability. Mining often happens under poor working conditions. The transport of raw materials is energy intensive and the recycling of used minerals is yet often not profitable and sometimes eludes today's state of the art. In this podcast, we want to ask, how is it possible that mineral supply chains can become more sustainable? Are voluntary goals of the industry enough or do they need stronger legislative guidelines? I'm happy to join the conversation with Christina Saulich and Svenja Schöneich, two global value chain experts at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, SWP, and Jean-Pierre Imbrogiano, a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Economics and Management at the University of Helsinki. Great to talk to you in Finland and Germany. Hello. Hi. Hi. Jean-Pierre, your research focuses on how sustainability performance happens in mineral supply chains. I already mentioned that the image of the industry along the mineral supply chain is rather bad. From your point of view, why is it that people still tend to associate the industry always with something negative? Thanks for that, Nicholas. I think it's actually not just the mineral industry that has this negative image. It's extractives in general. So we need to, of course, like include oil industry into this picture, right? And uh, I mean, there are a variety of reasons why they have these uh, bad images. I mean, we had environmental large-scale catastrophes. We have corruption scandals. There is child labor in uh, some mineral supply chains. And we even had like, I mean, situations where extractive projects turned into civil war and things like that. So it's quite obvious why there is a bad image. Christina and Svenja, you are both part of a project on transnational governance of sustainability commodity supply chains. Christina, at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, you analyzed the sustainability in the platinum supply chains in Southern Africa. And Svenja, you look at the copper supply chains from the Andean region to the EU. First to you, Christina, why platinum? Why did you decide to analyze this supply chain? Yeah, thanks, Nico. It may seem a bit odd to dedicate so much time to platinum, but actually platinum or the platinum group metals, which are actually a group of six different metals, are considered critical raw materials by the European Union. And this means that they are crucial for Europe's economy because they're used for producing a broad range of, of goods and applications that are used in everyday life in the EU. And on top of that, platinum is also one of the metals that will be needed for the green energy transition because it is used for fuel cell electric vehicles. And these fuel cell vehicles also have catalysts that use platinum. So the demand for platinum in the EU is rather high and it will remain high. But the EU itself, it doesn't produce any platinum except for the platinum that is recycled. So it has to source it from somewhere else. And in the case of platinum, the EU's major sources are South Africa, which is the world's largest producer of platinum, and Zimbabwe, which is the third largest producer of platinum. Short question, long answer, platinum. On the one hand, it's of high importance to the EU economy, but there is also a high risk associated with its supply and um, with the sustainability in the supply chain. And I think This makes it a very interesting and a very important case to look at. Thank you, Christina. So you mentioned uh, platinum is very important for the new technologies. When you look at the copper supply chains, why is copper needed these days? 
Actually, several of the aspects that Christina already mentioned for platinum also apply for copper. Copper is only present within our daily lives. Every electronic device we use has copper in it. And therefore, it is also very important also for the energy transition. For example, um, it is used in batteries such as in electric cars and wind turbines, etc., Copper also can be recycled, uh, actually, without losing its valuable properties. But the quantity of copper around is not enough to satisfy the demand in order to build um, the more electric cars, for example. The demand in order to build um, the more electric cars, for example, we would need for the energy transition. In the case of copper, the uh, largest part of the global supply is located in Chile and Peru in the Andean region, and they are the most productive mines in the world. Copper is sometimes already refined within the country itself, in Chile, for example, but sometimes it also leaves the harbor as ore and is then refined elsewhere and then processed. Uh, for example, in Germany, we have one of the biggest copper refineries in Europe, but most of the copper directly goes to Asia and is then processed there and then later comes to Europe uh, in form of the mentioned electric devices. And in the project, what we try to do is we try to track the metal along the whole chain and see which countries, companies and other actors play a part in it and then compare the two supply chains and look at possible gaps of sustainability. Let's look at sustainability. We already mentioned that more and more countries are trying to pass due diligence laws that might impact companies in the mineral supply chains. But Svenja and Christina, you both have written a very intense paper at SWP on Germany's law. But in our previous talk, you also mentioned that you see great potential for more sustainability in the so-called ESG criteria. Indeed, ESG is a very popular abbreviation these days and stands for environmental social governance. But Christina, what is ESG exactly and why do you think it could be a driver for more sustainability in the mineral supply chains? Well, ESG or environmental, social and governance, as you just mentioned, Nico, are three criteria that are used by socially conscious investors to measure or to screen the social and environmental impacts of potential investments in a company or in a fund, for instance. The environmental criteria refer to, for instance, energy consumption, greenhouse gas emissions or waste management. Social stands for how a company manages relationships with its employees, its suppliers, its customers, and also the impact on communities um, where it operates. And finally, governance refers to the procedures the company uses to govern itself. So these ESG criteria help investors avoid companies that fail to meet certain sustainability standards. And as you just mentioned, in recent years, we've seen a rise in ESG, and this means that more and more private and institutional investors and also lenders, such as banks, are including ESG criteria in their investment and lending decisions. And at the same time, the influence of um, ESG rating agencies that rank companies according to their ESG performance has also increased. So how does this affect mineral value chains? Um, Mining is a very capital intensive industry, so it depends heavily on access to finance and to access capital in the future, miners and also uh, refiners of metals, for instance, need to demonstrate commitment to ESG concerns and to do so, they need to become more transparent. So they need to provide the information on ESG that investors and vendors need. So to sum up, I'd say the rise of ESG has the potential to push companies in mineral value chains to become more sustainable and more transparent in order to stay competitive. Jean-Pierre, what do you think? Are ESG criteria a solution for more sustainability or do you think that the industry might find loopholes or finds loopholes to get around the regulatory requirements? So I think, I mean, regarding regulatory requirements, we really need to understand that regulation is key also for companies it's like the very basis for them to actually be able to exist and to operate it becomes problematic if there's corruption because then you can sort of negotiate what it means to be compliant with regulation and so on right and what i think what uh, happened in the past decades with uh, voluntary standards and what christina just said about the esg criteria and investor interests the rating agencies and so on 
is that we are actually in a huge debate about what does it actually mean for a business to be sustainable along such lines, right? So we also need to understand these initiatives, ESG criteria promoting initiatives, as sort of discursive platforms about what do we think is currently the right thing to do for businesses and whatnot. And we need to encourage these initiatives in terms of because at times they compensate regulation, right? So we have situations where there might be a lack of binding rules, there might be no clear targets, or there might be a lack of enforcement, maybe from government agencies, at least that's what you hear about some parts of the world. And there, like, it's very useful to have these compensating initiatives, definitely. And some of them, not many so far, unfortunately, to actually set clear targets where regulators don't do it. So let's maybe change the perspective a little and look from the perspective of the companies at these new criteria or at these criteria. Svenja, the copper supply chain in the Andean region, for instance, from the point of view of the companies, what are the challenges being faced by trying to be more serious about ESG? Of course, from the perspective of the companies, they also face uh, several challenges. Um, first of all, the mentioned problem of transparency, or if you wanted to frame it like a problem, let's say the lack of transparency may be one of the main issues. As long as you don't know about the conditions of your supplier and then his supplier and then the next supplier, it is very difficult to guarantee that your product has been produced under sustainable and fair circumstances, of course. In the Indian region, there are several productive mines And the ore from those different mines come together in one refinery and are bored then in a, the, a product form already. And so the firm who purchases this product is not always able to actually track the ore to every mine it has been from. And of course, we have this one problem, which always remains mining is never actually sustainable and environmental friendly. You said mining is never sustainable, but at the beginning we talked and you also talked about the new technologies that could improve sustainability or enhance. Christina, can you give us some examples of technological innovations? Sure. I think we're seeing quite a lot of innovation in mineral value chains at the moment. And this is partly due to the need to, to reduce operating costs and to improve productivity. But the technological change is also driven by the rise of ESG, which we've just, you know, which we've discussed earlier. For instance, mining companies are at the moment planning to invest in renewable power stations at mine sites to reduce dependence on fossil fuels. And actually, there's already one mine in Chile that relies 100% on renewable energy. Mining companies are also using water-saving technologies to reduce water consumption. They use artificial intelligence when planning mines to reduce mine footprints. And another example is transport. So commodities are usually transported by ships and some mining companies now plan to charter or to hire low carbon emission ships that use liquefied natural gas instead of heavy fuel oil. So these are just a couple of examples. But actually, I think the, the pandemic has somehow, you know, somewhat slowed down the mining industry to some extent because some of the mines had to close temporarily. But it's also in a way accelerated technological change and innovation in the mining industry because the industry had to adapt to the pandemic. So there's been, you know, quite a, a push for innovations and the use of new technologies lately. Jean-Pierre, what do you think? Do you think that the new technology leads to more sustainability? Wow, that's a very broad question, Nicolas. And I think we really need to focus on absolute reductions of environmental impacts. And I find this is too often not taken into consideration. And it's also for me a little bit with this green energy and the uh, e-mobility discussion in terms of like, are we really reducing our environmental impacts like on a global scale? If you think, for example, about the automotive industry, or are we just relocating environmental impacts to other parts of the world and thereby diversifying our impact? And these are like very open questions that I don't see sufficiently addressed yet, and particularly not in those discussions where usually people say we need to have new green 
technology and so on. What I usually miss in the sustainability discussions is much more an understanding how we as societies have produced sustainability challenges, meaning that there is something about our culture, about how we believe to live in this world and interact with this world that has produced major challenges, in particularly those that earth scientists are predicting to, like climate change, biodiversity loss, and so on. And that there is something about this culture we need to change. And just by pointing to the possibility of new technologies, I think we are actually perpetuating the same thing that we've done before. Okay, thank you, Jean-Pierre, for that perspective. But let's go back to the technology being a solution. Christina, looking at platinum, at the platinum supply chains, do you see technology changed a lot or is it also creating new problems? I would say it's a um, <laughs> very typical answer for a researcher. It depends, <laughs> or both. I really I, I agree to what Jean-Pierre just said. It's you know it always has two sides to it. And yes, on the one hand, the use of new technologies in platinum mining has produced positive effects, but it also has its side effects that companies and governments definitely need to tackle. Let me give you two concrete examples from the platinum value chain. For instance, platinum mines use huge trucks to transport ore. And these trucks use four to 5,000 liters of diesel per day. So you can imagine the pollution and the dust that these trucks produce. And today, mines are replacing these diesel trucks by hydrogen-powered fuel cell trucks. And this, of course, makes a contribution to reducing emissions at mines. So, But I'll also give you another example that gives you an idea of the um, social impacts that the use of technologies in the mining sector can have. What we are witnessing at the moment is that mining companies want to increase automation. So, you know, they're trying to use more machines and these machines take over certain tasks in the mines that previously previously humans did. And this has specific positive impacts, usually on the efficiency and also on productivity and probably also on the health and safety of workers because machines often take over, you know, the most dirty and cumbersome tasks. But at the same time, machines are also likely to replace lower paid and lower skilled and less educated workers. So with increasing automation, these jobs are at risk. And of course, the use of new technologies also creates jobs. But these jobs are usually higher skilled jobs. So let's sum up a little bit. We have talked about the ESG criteria. We've talked about the effects of technology and in the industry, there are also new sustainability standards and initiatives that really focus on the mineral industry. Jean-Pierre, you have analyzed different standards and initiatives during your research. Who develops them actually and what are their goals? In a few words, I know that's hard. <laughs> It's very hard, Nicholas. I mean, they are very diverse We talk in the mining industry, I think in the meantime, maybe about 40, maybe even 50 like different standards that exist uh, and with diverse scopes. Uh, who is developing them? I mean, they can be company or like association driven. There could be types of donor organizations behind them, NGOs, governments sometimes. So it really depends. And I think, I mean, we can generally say that they do try to make a difference somewhere in the industry for industry to be more responsible or if you want to call it sustainable in their production and operations. And I think that's a common denominator and they do it, of course, to very different extents. So we can say there is a jungle of these different initiatives and standards, but For instance, copper has a long mining tradition. Svenja, do you see that some of these standards are really widely accepted or is everybody actually applying his own standard? Yeah, uh, Nicholas, I think you touched uh, upon a very sensible uh, issue when calling it a jungle. Um, I mean, we have several different standards from different levels. For copper, especially since 2019, for example, there is a new certification system, also voluntary. This was especially developed for copper and therefore is called the copper mark. And besides uh, the mines, the copper mark also audits copper processors, such as refineries. But it still remains difficult to actually incorporate all stations of the whole chain. Would you say that this standard really makes a difference, that many companies adapt to it? 
I would definitely say it does make a difference that many companies now look at the standards and uh, try to improve their uh, ESG performance um, through such certification systems, uh, certainly. In which way it then actually incorporates the whole chain. I think this is rather the problem for uh, the sectors like the mining sectors, as mentioned. There are different standards and certification systems which are in place, which um, have been proven to improve the conditions in the mining sector. But for example, for the refineries, this is a rather new Or Jean-Pierre mentioned the, the transportation sector, which is not really incorporated in such auditing programs yet. And so it is still really hard to say, okay, this is one scheme which is widely accepted for the whole chain, for example. I would like to add another point here, if I may, just about the jungle thing, right? About these many standards and trying to understand what do they incorporate and what not. And I think from a company perspective, trying to understand these standards and particularly the nitty gritty about what do they want, what approaches do they recommend and things like that. If you try to understand them and compare them, it's really messy, like very messy. And that's just because the point I raised earlier, because we need to understand these standards as discussion platforms where basically we try to make sense of what, what we want to see in those businesses. And they all go a little bit into different directions. And it makes it difficult for industry to apply them, actually, if you haven't been part of setting them up in the first place. So putting together the pieces that we brought up, we talked about technology and the, the many, many different standards that we have. Um, looking at the mineral supply chains, what do you think can be or is the biggest driver for more sustainability in the near future? Svenja, maybe you want to start. I think uh, this can only work if we have uh, different drivers coming together and uh, pushing this whole idea forward. I mean, maybe this is uh, rather simple. And of course, it is not that simple. But I would think that the consumer also plays a role. Not the only one, of course. But maybe it is not enough anymore to ask for an organic banana or fair chocolate. Um, though that is very important, of course. But it also should be become more important to consider what our cars or houses consist of, for example. And this is far more complex and difficult to answer. But nevertheless, it's important to start a change maybe. But still, the consumer is not everything and demand alone won't change everything. But to be considerate about it and to ask about it and to ask also for a rise of the ESGs from the the perspective of the buyer of the end consumer or of a shareholder this uh, may be a good start jean pierre what do you think so i would generally agree to that i would just want to add maybe two uh, different perspectives and, and the first one is uh, from my work that we really need to understand much better what's going on inside the businesses and how they perform and sustainability objectives because i think sustainability initiatives, standards, or even like the new German law and so on, they would not make like the differentiation of trying to understand the diversity of businesses they are trying to address. And there is a lot of scope in driving sustainability from such a perspective. And the other thing that I mentioned before is really like this cultural part about what's actually going on in our society with regards to sustainability challenges. What are the like causes of it? And coming back in that regard to the topic about mining industry having a bad reputation, I think if a company or an industry has a bad reputation, it's also part because they mirror what's going on in our societies. You know, they're a part of our societies. They don't exist separate of it. We make the existence of these companies possible in their operations. And we really need to understand these entanglements also from a cultural point of view if we want to get to grips with our sustainability challenges. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Christina, what do you think? What can be a driver for more sustainability in the future? I think I definitely agree with Svenja that consumers can play an important role. I mean, if we as individuals want more sustainable mineral supply chains, then we have to change our personal buying and our investment behavior. And I think 
as a response, company in capital intensive industries, such as the mining sector, then have to adapt to follow the money. But of course, the problem with this approach is that consumer behavior is not something that changes overnight, but it's a very, very long process also because people often don't know what type of types of metals are used for which devices and how they're extracted. So I think a lot of awareness raising is still needed. And this also matches with what Jean-Pierre said, you know, we have to, it also has a, a cultural aspect to it. We have to kind of change our way of thinking about minerals and where they come from and what type of uh, sourcing we want. Let me ask you, pointing to the consumers, I mean, looking at the cell phone, you know, in a cell phone, you have, I don't know how many dozens of different uh, metals inside. How can the consumer really know what's inside a phone? How do you imagine this phone that a consumer can choose from? You know what I mean? This would include new labels. What do you think? Yeah, it, it would definitely have to include uh, more labels and it definitely requires more information by companies on how the metals that you know that were used to produce the phone have been sourced and what the problems and the risks along the supply chain are so i think a lot of it has to do with transparency making making uh, these supply chains more transparent sharing more information with consumers and maybe also developing certain seals that help consumers take decision which product to buy you know, like it is the case in, in um, the agricultural sector or in the textile sector. Yeah, I would very much agree with that and also add that the goal should not be to label products which are produced under sustainable circumstances, but rather to make sustainability the norm, like to actually enact legislations and criteria which ask for sustainably produced product as a norm and not for the exception which need an extra seal maybe so this would mean to raise the transparency along the chain but also to enforce a certain legislations which were also already mentioned and if i could just add one uh, small point here one problem i think that we also that we're also facing in mineral value chains is that there is no price premium for sustainably produced metals. And I think this is also a, a problem that the sector has and that might have to change. And again, this has to do with buyer, with the buyers and with consumers that have to be willing maybe to also pay more in order to make sure that the phone that they're using is not built with dirty metals. Mm, yeah, obviously. Sorry if I may add something here. I know at least there are cases within mineral supply chains where buying firms, so not like end consumers, are willing to pay a premium price for the right production. So these things exist, but it's definitely not mainstream yet. Coming to the end, going back to our question at the beginning, the bad reputation of the mining industry. What do you think? Are the factors that we mentioned relevant and are they likely to change the mining industry's bad image? Jean-Pierre, what do you think? In a few words. Oh, in a few words. Uh, um, I honestly don't think all mining companies have a bad image. So we really need to differentiate about who we talk about when we say the mining industry. They are a very diverse bunch of companies and we should take a little bit more care about that. There are quite some good advanced mining operations, but still like it's a question of what we call sustainable and not and whether like an industrial operations as mining is can ever comply with such ideas. Thank you, Christina. Well, I'm not sure if the factors that we mentioned will actually change the mining industry's image. But one thing I am currently observing is that the miners industry is working very, very hard to change its image itself. So big mining companies see the energy transition as a window of opportunity for presenting themselves as a green industry and as an industry that drives the energy transition. Because as you mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, Nico, metals are essential for a zero carbon future. So I would say the energy transition is creating a momentum for the industry to change its image. And to be fair, the industry is also making efforts, you know, to clean up its practices and its reputation. But of course, the mining industry's contribution to a greener future should also not be used as an excuse for continuing with unsustainable practices in the value chain. So helping countries to decarbonize is not enough. The mining industry itself has to work on decarbonizing itself too. And I think if it does its image will also improve. 
Thank you, Christina. What do you think, Svenja? Yeah, I would definitely second what, what Christina just said. Mining is in itself not a very sustainable activity because it extracts resources from the ground which do not regrow. But to really move forward the mentioned energy transition, we need those metals. And to really have a greener future, we need to make it, let's say, as less harmful as possible. And there are very forward-looking uh, initiatives that we already mentioned in the mining industry. Also, we we should not forget that the mining sector also is uh, a large employer and that it is part of um, the development of many regions and also benefits many people in that sense. And we need to take care that in these regions that they are not abandoned and left behind after the metals are extracted. Thank you so much for this fruitful discussion. Jean-Pierre Imbrogiano from the Department of Economics and Management at the University of Helsinki, dialing in from Finland. Christina Saulich working on sustainability in the platinum supply chain and Svenja Schöneich looking at the copper supply chain at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, SWP. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Great discussion. This podcast is brought to you by the research network Sustainable Global Supply Chains, which brings together leading researchers from around the globe. In the next episode, we will have a look at intended and unintended consequences of standards and regulations on agro-based value chains. I'm Nicholas Martin. Thank you for joining us. Stay tuned and stay safe. <laughs>